This morning's scripture reading is from the prophet Malachi, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to your heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. He feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Welcome, Redemption. It's great to have you. My name is Brandon. I get the privilege of being one of the pastors here on staff. And we are, of course, going through the book of Malachi. Before we go there, though, I do want to let you know that as you exit here today, and you may have seen it on your way in, we have a little table set up, um, and it is celebrating a Walk for Life, which will be happening November 5th with a woman's choice. What is a woman's choice? It's a pregnancy resource center right here in town that helps mamas uh, who have an unexpected pregnancy and the dads as well. And so here at Redemption, we have a culture of life. We love celebrating life. And so I would encourage you to stop by that table, find out more information about the Walk for Life so you can be a part of it and help, again, just create a culture of life here in this city. So the book of Malachi, that's what we're journeying through right now. It is a very unique book. It is written uh, by Malachi. He is the prophet of this book. And we don't know a whole lot about Malachi. All we really know is this book. We don't know really his backstory at all. We just know his calling and what God had called him to do. Literally, his name means a messenger from God. So that's who Malachi is. This is occurring approximately 400 years before the birth of Christ. And what's really unique about this book, so it's 400 years, God will go silent after this book. God will go silent for 400 years. Uh, the people of Israel, they won't have any prophets. They won't have any new words. Uh, they won't have any scripture, uh, new scripture for themselves. They won't have anything. God will be silent for 400 years. And then we have the birth of Jesus. So that's where this kind of lays out. It's preparing or setting the table for the birth of Christ in this nation of Israel. And here's what we've already learned. The nation of Israel has got some serious problems. There is a very clear reason why the Lord is sending Malachi to these people. We learned this last week. The people of Israel, they were bringing their offerings, but they weren't bringing offerings worthy of the king, worthy of God. No, they were bringing offerings that were lame and sick. They were taking their leftovers or what was stolen, and they were offering this up to God for forgiveness of sins as a thanksgiving offering. So they were offering that which was like leftover, unworthy to God. And God goes, hey, Malachi, go ahead and let them know this isn't just inadequate these leftover offerings are just simply evil. Let them know that I am a worthy and a great king. I am a father who loves them. Bring them back through this instruction. So that's what's happening in the nation of Israel. Now, what he does in this passage that we just read is he really hones in on the leaders. We know this by experience. Businesses often fail because of leadership, right? 
Classrooms or schools often fail because of lack of leadership. Governments fall because of a lack of leadership or bad leadership. Leadership matters tremendously. And bad leadership has this influence to affect many, many people. In Israel, the leadership was horrific. The priests, they were the ones that were offering up these, these lame and these blind sacrifices, these unworthy sacrifices. They were the ones. Now, what was the overall job of the priest? This is really important for all of us to know. Like, what was the job of an Old Testament priest? Well, they essentially function as a mediator between a holy God and an unholy people. They were the, the go-between. The, the way that you would offer up your sacrifice is you wouldn't just create an altar at your house. No, you'd bring it to the priest who would then at the temple offer it up for forgiveness of sins or Thanksgiving offering, a peace offering. So they were the spiritual mediators of Israel. And they had different jobs and functions, some of which they were called to read, keep, and teach the law to the people. So what we're doing right now, we're going, we're looking at scriptures. Hopefully I'm doing a good job of teaching you. They did the exact same thing, but for the people of Israel. And they would teach them the Old Testament. So they would offer up sacrifices, they would teach them, and they would also be judges. So if you had a dispute against somebody else, you would bring it before the priest. So they had this religious um, influence, but they also had this political influence in many ways. They would go ahead and render judgments. They would take the law, apply the law to situations and make judgments. That's what they were supposed to do. Now, what were the priests actually doing? Well, my friends, this is a display of poor poor leadership. Let's go ahead and read the last two verses of this passage. It says this, but you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despise and abase before all the people inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. So we know their, their role was to be the spiritual leaders, the mediators. This is what they were actually doing. And this is truly a display of bad leadership. So some of you are like, hey, listen, God's not calling me to be a pastor. So I don't, I'm not sure that this passage applies to me. I'm not going to become a priest. So I don't really need this passage. Well, let me tell you this. At some level, you are likely a leader. If you're a parent, you're a leader. At your job, you may be a teacher and you have a class, you are a leader. At your job, you may manage and oversee other co-workers, you are a leader. If you serve here at Redemption, we consider you a leader. There's all different kinds of roles. So what's a good leader and what is a poor leader? Also think about this. We all at some level are following someone or something. So are we following good leadership or are we following poor leadership? So we're all leaders and followers in some capacity. And so we would do well to take what is displayed for us in this passage and go, well, this is something I need to really hone in on. So first and foremost, here's what we see with the priests. Again, poor leadership. The sins of the priests, first and foremost, they had turned aside from the way. So they were called to be, again, these mediators, these go-between between the people and God. And yet they themselves didn't actually follow God. They were called to the way and instruct people in the way, but they weren't doing that themselves. We've talked about this before here at Redemption. The best leaders are incarnational leaders. You're like, what does that mean, incarnational leaders? Well, incarnational leadership, let's just simply put it this way a living embodiment of an attribute. In other words, as a leader, I don't ask you to do something I'm not personally willing to do. I don't ask you to be generous, to make great sacrifices, to serve, unless I am actually doing those things myself. I'm a living embodiment to what I'm teaching you. And of course, these priests with integrity couldn't say, hey, yeah, 
Follow God, we are too. No, they had turned aside. They had rebelled against God. So how in the world could they lead people? Uh, There's a passage in 1 Corinthians that I often go back to when I think about incarnational leadership. To be a leader that says, hey, I'm not going to call you to do anything I'm not willing to do. It's Paul, and he's talking to this church, and he had planted this church. He was a leader to them, and this is what he says. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Like, that's a real leader right there. A real leader can look at those that are following him or her and go, hey, if you follow me, I'm not perfect, but if you follow me, I'm going to lead you to Jesus because I'm following him. So we know this, great leaders are first followers. And they're incarnational. They're setting the example. They're a living embodiment of what they're actually teaching the people to do. So so parents, let me just apply this to your unique situation. How do we teach our children if we aren't willing to do it ourselves? How do we teach them to pray if we're not actually praying ourselves or reading the scriptures and seeking God or being generous or being sacrificial or servant-hearted and humble if we're not that living embodiment of those principles and values? How do we expect to create cultures in our workplace and in our churches Again, if we're not a living embodiment of these principles. So first and foremost, a good leader never asks those that are following to do something that they themselves aren't willing to do. And of course, we know the priests have all turned aside. They've turned aside themselves. Second, they have caused many to stumble through their instruction. Here's why they caused many to stumble in their instruction. There was wild inconsistencies. There's inconsistencies. I'm teaching you about God, and yet my life is showing I'm unwilling to follow him. Do you see how inconsistent that is? Research will tell us this. If you and I are inconsistent parents, if we live in households where we're teaching about Jesus, yet not actually living it out, our kids will leave the faith. It's research. It, 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 it's, it's data-driven. That will happen likely to our children if we don't actually follow the Lord ourselves. Why? We'll cause many to stumble because of our inconsistency. They were causing many to stumble because they were wildly inconsistent with their teaching and with their lives. And inconsistency always creates more inconsistency. Uh, Our faith, we are called to both teach and live. I love what 1 John 3.18 says. He says, little children speaking to his children in the faith. He says, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Like our faith requires word and action. It's both and. It's not just simply instructing about Jesus, but it's also showing the way of Jesus through how we live. And of course, they were causing many to stumble because they were teaching one thing and not even wholeheartedly teaching it and living a completely different way. Next, they level this accusation that they have corrupted the covenant of Levi. The Lord had established this covenant with Levi and his descendants that essentially they would serve as priests. They would serve him forever as priests. They would be these mediators between a holy God and unholy people if, if they actually followed him, loved him, taught truth. And he goes, this covenant that I established with you leaders, with you, Levi, you guys have run from it. You guys have degraded it through how you're living. And so this beautiful covenant between Levi and God is beginning to be degraded because they're not honoring him. And then last, you see that these priests, they were showing partiality. Again, a priest in this day would actually function as a judge. 
They would have power to, to render judgments in specific situations. They would take the law and they would apply the law if you had an issue with someone else. And so what they were doing is they were making unjust distinctions between people. So they're like, hey, I, I like you and I don't really like you. So I'm going to render a judgment that doesn't give justice, but gives injustice. And let's be honest, like for us, we live in a culture that is driven by favoritism and partiality. If you look at research, we see that attractive people are treated better than those deemed unattractive. Those that are taller are, are, are treated better than those that are shorter. Those that are wealthier are treated better than those that are poorer. Why? Well, that's because we often show partiality. And our calling as followers of God is not to show favoritism because of something external. Because you look a certain way, you're in a social, social economic status that I want to be in or I desire. No. Nope. In our faith, we are called to be impartial. So what ways is favoritism showing up in your life and my life? Of course, for these priests, he's saying, you guys are giving unjust distinctions. And that's not how my people are called to be led. So that's what he is leveling against them. These are their sins. This is a picture of bad leadership. Now, God in his grace is going to give them what? An opportunity to turn. Yes, they're causing many to stumble. Yes, they are not following what they're actually teaching. Yes, they've turned aside. They're showing partiality. But in his grace, he's going to offer repentance. Here's what he says at the very beginning of this passage. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not listen, listen, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts. Then, a lot of if and then, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your face, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. You're like, hey, you're just talking about God's grace. And then you read a passage on dung. Okay, I'm seeing a disconnect. So it's very, very vivid imagery that he is giving. See, priests, whenever they were going to sacrifice an animal, they would only offer certain parts of the animal. Only certain parts of the worthy animal were worthy to be offered up to God. So they wouldn't offer up the entire animal. No, there was like preparation and work before and they would take the intestines and they would take that out. They would not offer those up. They would take the fat around the intestines, but not the intestines themselves. And they would take that outside of the camp, outside of the city, and they would burn that up. And if you touch them, you were unclean. Of course, if you know anything about biology, you would know that the intestines and dung are closely related. He goes, Here, here's the thing. Those are unworthy to be sacrificed to me. Uh, they make you unclean, unfit for service. So you're living this way, and I'm going to show you in a very visible way that you are unfit for service as priests, as mediators. And it's literally this vivid imagery of like, I'm going to take dung. Not literally, but figuratively, I'm going to take it and put it in a very prominent place so everybody sees that you're unworthy and unfit to be a mediator because of how you're living. And they're going to know why you're not serving me. So again, God in his grace, he's calling them to repent. He's saying, come, come back. If you'll take it to heart, if you'll listen to me, these things won't happen. Come back to me. And his mercy and grace, he is calling them back. And then what he does is he begins to paint a picture for us of what good leadership is. So it was, this is bad leadership. These are the consequences. But here's what a good leader looks like. And again, for all of us in here, at some level, you are likely leading someone. You're a leader. And all of us at some level are followers. So what is good 
leadership. Well, here's a beautiful picture. Malachi 2, 5, and 6. He says, my covenant with him, that's with Levi, was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. I actually think here what Malachi is doing is he's actually painting a picture of Jesus. See, we know that the covenant with the Levites was that they would serve God as the mediator between, again, God and men. But in the New Testament, we find out that Jesus is actually our high priest. He is our true mediator. So how do we come to a holy, righteous God? Well, it's only because of Jesus. And we know things that, like there was no deceit found on his lips. What does it say right here? No wrong was found on his lips. I actually think this is just alluding to the perfect high priest priest, King Jesus. And it's a perfect example of what real leadership looks like. Well, what does it look like? First and foremost, the good leader fears God. Now, it's the Halloween season. I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. I enjoy scaring children. The younger, the better, too. Um, and so I enjoy scaring children. Um, I'm always pulling pranks, which I, I'm finding this out. If you're a parent, it's like, be careful what you do when they're younger, because then when they're older, they'll do back to you. But their brains aren't fully developed, so they do it back to you in a much worse fashion. And so throughout my kids' lives, I'm always playing pranks. I'm hiding, jumping out, scaring them. I enjoy that, but I found out that they actually are beginning to do that to me, and I don't like it as much when it's done to me. I like doing it to others, bad leader. But this fear, right? This fear of scaring. Often when we hear the word fear, that's what we think of. Like it's just terror. It's this moment of, of I am scared. And yet the Bible speaks differently of fear. I think in some level, it's more of a mixture of different things, not terror, dread, and being afraid. It's found 150 times in the Old Testament, this idea of fear. And really what it means is reverence. I wanna paint two pictures. There's a servile fear. And this is essentially fear that you, you you are afraid of a master who is harsh and unyielding. You, like whenever he's around, you kind of cower a little bit because you're, you're scared of him. There's terror in your heart. You're scared to approach this master. There's fear inside of you. This is not the fear in which the Bible talks about. The fear in which the Bible talks about is more family related. And you're like, what do, what do you mean by that? It's like a son or a daughter that has a parent. And in their heart, there is a mixture of reverence, fear, pleasure, joy, and awe. So when I think about God, there are some parts of who he is that are terrifying. The immensity of God, like like it overwhelms my brain to try to think of how big our universe is, right? I mean, it's an overwhelming thought. It's actually kind of terrifying to think about eternity, and yet he is greater than all of that. I mean, that's kind of a scary thought. He's a holy God that in some ways is terrifying to think of, and yet the Bible says even though he is those things, we can approach him with confidence. Because while he is that great, he is also that good. And he loves us dearly. And so we can approach him in awe, in respect and reverence, but also in joy and in pleasure. See, fear is understanding my place in the universe, who God is and who I am. I'm in my proper place. I'm under him. And so every good leader has this inside of them. There is a real, true fear, reverence, joy inside their heart when they think about who God is. So a good leader is first a follower and places themselves under the Lord. Second, 
It says that Levi instructs truthfully. Nothing false comes from his mouth. No, he teaches or preaches truth. He doesn't teach to tickle the ears of those listening. He doesn't shrink back. No, he stands on what God says and holds firm to it. Now, we certainly live in a culture that is always kind of shifting sands, if you will. The values that were once a part of my childhood are no longer the values that I see as an adult. I mean, culture's always shifting and changing what is important and what is valuable. And yet what we see in the scriptures are that God has laid a firm foundation. And we are called to stand on that firm foundation, even if culture rejects it. Now, here's the thing. The Bible doesn't call us to be jerks either. I found sometimes that the people that are the most courageous in giving you truth can sometimes not have their message heard because they don't bathe it in love. So we are called to preach and teach truth in what? Love. It's both in. It's truth and love. And sometimes culture will hate us even when we do that, and that is okay. But yet, we see a good leader walks in truth. They teach truth no matter the consequences, and they do so in love. Third, we see that he walks with God. See, he doesn't just talk the talk. It actually says that he, he walks with him. We see this, of course, in King Jesus, who walked perfectly with the Father. So we don't just talk the talk. We walk the walk. Again, we're incarnational leaders. We're a living embodiment of this. Here's what I love about the uniqueness of the Christian faith. Only in the Christian faith does God really understand. Do you realize all other faiths, even if they believe that there's only one God, it's very difficult for God to understand what we are going through. It's difficult for God to understand loss because he hasn't really experienced it like us. It's difficult for him to to understand betrayal or abuse or hurt. It's difficult for him to understand those things because he's a distant God who has not experienced those things. And yet in the Christian faith, here's what we have. God steps out of the throne room of heaven, puts on flesh and blood, and what we have experienced and gone through, he has experienced and gone through. He has embodied what we are going through. And when we come to him with our hurts and the betrayal that we've been through, he's like, yeah, I know. Me too. I love what 1 Peter 2, 21 says. It says for this, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. We've been called to something. Jesus has also walked through that, leaving you what? leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. A good leader, he not just talks the talk, but he walks the walk. Why? Because there's a great fear of God, a reverence. And then finally, it says that he turns many away from iniquity. Iniquity is one of the Old Testament words used for sin, So the way that he is leading is actually helpful to those he is leading. Here's a couple questions. The first is, are you a leader? You want to know how you know you're a leader? Is anybody following you? When you look back, if nobody is following you, then you're not a leader. Now, here's a question. Are you a good leader? When you look back, where are you actually, and then look forward, where are you leading people? Throughout history, we know of many poor leaders. They were certainly leaders. They had a great following, but they were not leading people well or in the right direction. Levi turns many from iniquity. He looks back and goes, hey, yep, follow me as I follow Christ. Come, come. And they're, they're saying, you know what? We're done with sin. We're repenting. We're turning back to God. We're, we're, we're done with our old life. We want a new life. We're sick of living this way. We, we want the life that only God can give. He turns many from iniquity. 
This, my friends, is a picture of a good leader. And so my question to you is, who are you leading right now? And how are you leading them? It could be a kid. It could be students. It could be coworkers. It could be family members. It could be your marriage. How are you leading them? And where you and I will land is our hope is actually not founded on how good our leadership is. That's our calling. Our calling is to be great leaders, but our hope is in this and this alone, that we follow the supreme example of an incredible leader. That is King Jesus.